Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. Finally onto tier 5 today, which is a fairly small rank compared to the others, but the vehicles here are all quite unique in their own way, so it's still managed to be a fairly long video. Before we start though, I have a quick announcement regarding the shop, if you just want to get to the video though, skip to this point. So the shop will be up for about another week, and then I'll be closing it for a while while I sort some other stuff out. I'm not sure exactly how long it'll be closed for, but it's likely going to be for a fairly long time. So no pressure to get anything, but if you are interested in anything on there I'd get it soon as it won't be updated for a fairly long time. Anyway, let's get into the actual video. As always, I really hope you enjoy. So, first off today we have the T-54-1947, the start of a very prominent line of Russian MBTs, and this version shares a fair few similarities to the previous tank in the line, the T-44-100. It uses the same 100mm gun, with the same ammunition types as well, three APHE rounds, as well as smoke and APCR. The reload though is shorter at 11.1 seconds stock, making it a little bit more competitive at close range this time around. Mobility as well is pretty good. It's overall slower than the T-44, but not by much. Off-road, they're very similar in terms of straight line speed. The T-54 isn't exceedingly mobile, but mobile enough to get it where it needs to be. The hull traverse is also very quick, which allows you to turn and react to enemies on your sides pretty easily. Armor protection is pretty effective as well, but not quite as good as it used to be. The mantlet of this thing's turret used to be 200mm thick with an internal 50mm spool liner. Now it uses a volumetric armor layout, which makes the actual protection vary quite a lot. In certain spots the thickness is below 100mm and in others it's higher than 200 For the main part of the central mantlet though, it's only around 100 to 150mm of reliable armor, which isn't really too great. However, like all the previous tanks, if you keep on the move as to not let enemies aim accurately, you will still bounce a lot of shots. The rest of the turret has a lot of sloping and overall is pretty well protected. So the armour here is far from bad, it's just not reliably effective. The hull though is a bit more reliable. The front plate is 120mm thick, with the hull sides being 80 So if you angle, you can make the hull entirely immune from all AP and APHE rounds you'll fight, even the early Sabo struggles at range as well. So the overall protection isn't bad, which is a very good thing as this tank somewhat relies on its protection to be effective. This thing is at 7.7 alongside a lot of other MBTs for other nations, the Leopard 1, M60, STB etc, and as this is a much earlier vehicle, it's much less developed than all of them in terms of actual technology. Where other MBTs focus on mobility, stabilizers or heat rounds, this thing sticks to the formula of earlier tanks and doesn't really develop much. These contemporary vehicles have the handhold of stabilizers or armor negating rounds, whereas this T-54 relies mostly on the brute force of its armor and gun, which are by no means useless. The gun can still penetrate and one-shot mostly everything you'll fight, and the armor will still protect you against a lot of the weaker guns and even some of the stronger guns if you're lucky. So all in all, it's effective enough in every area it needs to be, in the tank trifecta of firepower, mobility and armor. It's good in every aspect. You can brawl and use the armor as long as you're not up to it too harshly, or you can snipe at long range where the gun largely will still work fine, and of course the armor will be even more effective. At pretty much every range in every situation, you'll have assets that will work. Because of this, it's quite hard to recommend a specific playstyle, as it can work at long range, close range, and everywhere in between. So whatever your playstyle is, this thing will just mold around it. Personally, I like to use this thing quite aggressively though, brawling at close range as long as I'm below 8.7. The armor of this thing works at its best when you can force enemies into rushing a shot at you, so being aggressive and pushing will likely lead them to make a rushed shot, which will likely bounce. You can also effectively bait shots with your front plate as well. The Mod 47 can work here really well, but just be careful of tanks that can fire heat as there's no way to block it. Ultimately though, as long as you make yourself a hard target to hit by staying on the move and keeping angled, you can really play it anywhere. Pros. Good firepower, good mobility, good survivability, and versatile. At cons, unreliable armor, and suffers and up tiers. And again, like the last video, every tank this tier has poor gun depression, so just take it as a given in the cons for all of these vehicles. Anyway, verdict? Get it, it's a great MBT that will work effectively on most maps and BRs. It's not quite as good as it once was, but it's a decent, versatile, middle of the road tank that can effectively fill a lot of roles in battle. It's a great one to go for this tier. Next up, a bit of a redesign, the T-54-1949 which doesn't change up the formula too much. Of course though, the main change of this new variant is the turret, which apart from the cupola, removes the frontal turret weak spots the previous version had. 
Generally, this turret offers around 220 plus millimeters of protection, which is enough to nullify most AP and APHE rounds. A downside though is that the turret drive is slower by a few degrees, so it isn't quite as responsive in close range environments. The front plate as well is also a bit weaker, at 100mm thick instead of 120 This doesn't change much, although it is easier for Sabo and high calibre AP to get through this tank. Generally though, the armour still works. The only other change is that this version gets a new round, a Sabo shot. As far as Sabo goes, it does the job. It can easily break through heavily sloped armour, and is very easy to aim over distances. It doesn't do very much damage, but as long as you disable the breach or hit ammo, it will do the job it needs to do. I personally still use the last APHE shell as my main round though, as it does dispatch enemy tanks much faster and more reliably. Although it is worth taking out a few rounds of Sabo if you need to snipe, or for engaging some more heavily armoured targets. Apart from that, the 1949 is the same as the previous version really. The mobility is identical as well. This thing is a lot stronger against weaker tanks that don't use Sabre or Heat, so its armour is a little bit more consistent. However, down to the slightly slower turret traverse, it can't brawl quite as reliably. It can still definitely play this way though as long as you're careful and watch for enemies on your sides. All in all though, this thing doesn't change up the playstyle much, it's still good in all the same areas and can fill all the same roles. I would maybe consider hanging back and sniping with it a little more down to the improved turret armour. The weaker front plate and slower traverse make brawling a little bit harder, but definitely not impossible. The tank can still play that way. Overall it has a few buffs and nerfs, but will generally play to the same advantages. Pros. Good firepower. Good mobility. Good survivability. And versatile. The cons, unreliable armour, and suffers an up to is pretty much the same. Verdict? Get it. It still works great as a versatile MBT and rounds off the lineup well. It isn't objectively better or worse than the 1949, so you might end up preferring that one more, but regardless, this version still works and has its place. Next up, finally the last T54, the 1951. Almost identical to the 49, but with a few changes. The turret is slightly redesigned, being a little bit stronger at the back. And the cupola as well is slightly larger on this version, which does make it a bit easier for weaker APHE shots to get into the turret. Although, generally you'll rarely find that enemies will go for this weak spot. The only other change is, again, to the firepower, as this version gets another new round, a Heat FS shell. This round of course will trigger hull breaks, which can be quite useful at this tier, and can get through 380mm of armour, making it a tiny bit worse than L7 Heat, but not really by a noticeable amount. Apart from that, this tank is practically identical to the previous version, and not much with the playstyle changes either. The only active change is the new round really. In any case, I'd still stick with the APHE unless you're up-tiered, as it will still one-shot more effectively. But it is still a good idea to take some heat for certain tricky vehicles you might encounter. Much like the others though, at long range or close range, it'll do the job. Pros, no prizes for guessing all of these. Good firepower, good mobility, good survivability, and versatile. And the cons, unreliable armour, and suffers an up tiers. Verdict? I'd consider it. It's by no means a bad vehicle, but it's not really vital that you use it. As it's folded with the other two T-54s, you don't really need to unlock and play it to progress. And if you only have 5 or 6 crew slots, there isn't really any great need to have 3 T-54s at 7-7. If you do really like the playstyle, it's not a bad vehicle to get though. Ultimately, it is up to you, but I wouldn't really rush to unlock this one in any case. As there are a fair few other vehicles this tier that will add to the lineup more. Next up, something heavy, the IS-3, a very recognisable vehicle. Compared to the IS-2, the 3 is drastically improved defensively, but remains mostly the same offensively, using the same 122mm gun. But it does get a new unlockable round, the BR-471D. This round has 25mm of extra flat penetration, but loses 50 grams of filler. The round still performs great though, despite the 50 gram loss, and will commonly one-shot all the same. Compared to the regular B round, it isn't quite as effective against angled armour, but the extra penetration across the board almost equals them out. So I would go with the D round once you unlock it. A downside though is the turret rotation at 5.4 degrees a second stock, which is really poor. The main change though of course, which justifies the whole BR jump from the previous IS tank, is the armour, which is great and terrible both at the same time. Frontally, apart from the turret ring, and a tiny spot by the optic, it's almost immune from every AP and APHE round it'll fight, which is really good, but it's weak to almost every chemical round at the same time. L7 Sabo 2, which puts this tank in a very annoying situation in a very rock, paper, scissors kind of way. If you run into a tank that can only use AP or APHE, you're in a very strong position. 
although if you run into a tank with chemical rounds, your armor largely means nothing, which does mean that you can't use this thing as a constantly aggressive heavy tank, because at NEBR you can't guarantee that you'll only run into enemies that won't be using chemical rounds. At its own battle rating of 7.3, you've got a good shot, but anything above this and it really does lose most of its advantages. Disregarding the new round, this thing is an entire BR above its predecessor because of the armor, and if it can't use that armor reliably, it just can't make for a good heavy tank. Annoyingly, tanks like this are almost impossible to fairly balance, and by that I mean heavy tanks that don't have reliable weak spots. Sure, the turret ring is a weak spot, and you can happily click away at it perfectly in the armor simulator, but it's undeniably a hard spot to hit perfectly in the heat of combat. If this thing were any lower, it would become a huge problem for a lot of tanks, because its weak spots are just so small and inconsistent. I can in no way deny that it's annoying playing the IS-3 against stabilizers and heat at 8.0, but you would probably feel the same way if you were fighting the IS-3 at range range in a stock panther. There's just currently no way where a tank like this can be perfectly balanced in such a way where it's fair to the player fighting it and fair to the player playing it. It's either going to work incredibly well or not at all, which is also why lineups are really important. If the battle ratings were spread out so the tail end of the armor meta didn't meet teams full of vehicles with stabilizers, that fire essentially armor negating rounds it would fare a lot better. So we'll just have to see how things develop in the future. Anyway though, for the tank itself, it still does have a fair bit going for it. The gun will largely still work well, and for what it's worth, the armor can still protect against a lot of tanks you'll fight, and the advantage of the pike nose is that you don't really need to angle, it's basically already done for you. Its mobility is close to the same as the IS-2, although as the 3 is a bit heavier it is slightly slower, but overall not by a huge amount. So you can roll around the map easily when spaded. Like the IS-2s though, I'd still recommend playing at range where your weak spots are much harder to hit with kinetic rounds. And as for chemical rounds, there's no way you can really negate them, so making yourself a smaller target at range is really all you can do. That or play hull down, but it's still not quite consistent. Your reload, despite being a second faster than the IS-2, is still 26 seconds stock, so you can't really safely brawl in very close proximity to enemies due to just how easy it is for them to rush you. In addition to this is the slow turret traverse, which makes it a lot harder for you to react to enemies coming from different lines of sight. Although, this time around you do have an advantage the IS-2s didn't, and that's two unlockable smoke grenade barrels that drop off the back of the tank. So if return fire is inevitable, you can drop one of these and reverse into the smoke using the very responsive reverse gear. Enemies will rarely risk pushing into the smoke, so this can save you sometimes if you're forced into a close range engagement. Also, as counterintuitive as it may sound, if you're caught at close range and about to be shot by an AP or APHE round, angle slightly and either drive forwards or backwards. Competent enemies will either go for your turret ring or barrel, they're not going to focus on the hull armor. So if you remain head on and drive forwards or backwards, the weak spot of the ring is going to stay in the same place, a thin line directly in front of them. But if you're angled and can drive on the move, that thin line starts to change perspective as well, which makes it much harder to track and hit. So do keep this in mind too. Range is where you should aim to be, but if the match calls for it, you can push for the caps and roll around aggressively. Doing this late game is much more reliable though, as the enemy team will likely be down to backups, lessening the chance of running into a vehicle with heat. So it does have some versatility there. Ultimately though, it is a tank that relies on its armor to work, and to make that armor reliably work, mid to long range is where you want to be. Pros? Good firepower. Good potential armor and versatile. And the cons? Long reload, inconsistent survivability, and suffers an uptears. Verdict? I'd still get it. You can definitely have some great games if you get a lucky roll of the map in BR, and in any case it can still work well in the late game. There is also a lineup at 7.3, so you don't really need to force yourself to play the IS-3 in up tiers if you do have all the other tanks. So it's definitely a workable vehicle, but just don't expect consistency. Next up, we have the IS-4M, another heavy tank that generally fares a lot better than the IS-3. The reload is around a second longer, but apart from that, firepower is identical. But the significant buff here is to the armor, which is a lot more consistent overall. The armor model is obviously very detailed, but to generalize, apart from the driver's port, this thing is frontally immune from APHE and AP rounds. There is a chance you'll get shot trapped, but this won't really happen regularly. If you angle, the hull is immune from L7 Sabo, and your turret is pretty well protected against it too. The only round around this BR that really poses a big threat to you is heat. In certain spots, the turret can sometimes protect you against L7 heat, especially around the mantlet, but there's no way to entirely negate it. If you angle, you can sometimes nullify the weaker 90mm heat rounds, but generally 105 heat will be able to punch through your armor. The best you can do is angle and hope the round hits your track or a heavily angled part of the turret. Overall though, the armor is very effective below 8.7. 
The mobility of the IS-4 isn't much improved from the IS-3. It's 12 tons heavier, but also has a much more powerful engine, with fans. It's a little bit faster in a straight line, but it is slower to turn and manoeuvre when compared to the IS-3. When spaded, it's manageable, but it is very sluggish stock. In general, really, this thing is a slog when stock, especially regarding firepower as you start off with a stock shell that you first unlock at 5.3. The 122T will still work at this BR, but the stock shells are a bit underwhelming. This is really the last tank in the line that actually plays like a conventional heavy tank, and as such, I wouldn't really recommend playing it as your first spawn if you're up against 8.7s, as the APF-SDS and stabilizers they carry will basically nullify all of your advantages. All you really have to rely on is the armor, so if you're on a map or battle rating where the armor won't be reliable, you might as well play another vehicle. If you are playing below 8.7 though, and especially at your own BR of 7.7, this thing can work really, really well. Its armor is just reliable enough to be able to play it at close range too, as you don't really have any weak spots apart from the driver's port, which you can basically negate by angling. The only rounds that can really get through you are heat rounds, which have the same penetration over distances, so playing at long range to try and buff the armor won't really work. This tank really can be a great spearhead for the team if you have their support. You can take a lot of fire and draw it away from your squishier teammates, and hold important choke points or caps in the map. If you do want to play at close range brawling, make sure you do have some friendlies nearby. You don't want to be caught on reload as you can quite easily get flanked in that time. And you will commonly lose your barrel as well, so having some teammates to cover your retreat if this happens will help a lot. If you don't fancy relying on your teammates though, you can just really position yourself anywhere, although do keep in mind the gun depression. If you're on your own though, just make sure there's enough distance between you and your potential enemies so they can't rush you during your 20 plus second reload. There are a lot of fast MBTs and light vehicles around this BR, so be very careful of these machines. Machines. As well as the 50 cal you have on the roof, you also have a coaxial 50 cal in the turret, which can be useful against soft targets as well. All in all though, this thing has a very general playstyle. Avoid playing in a max up tier if you can, and try and position yourself around some teammates and you should get some good results. Pros. Good firepower. Great armour. And versatile. And the cons. Long reload. And suffers in up tiers. Verdict. Get it. Once upgraded, this thing can work great. It's fairly slow and sluggish in all respects, but the armor does make up for it. Because this thing's advantages rely on it not being too harshly uptiered, I would go for some of the other tanks this tier first, the T-54s and the vehicle we're going to look at next, as they all generally will work more reliably in uptiers, and you don't want to force yourself to play this thing if you don't have to. In the right situation though, it can work really, really well. Next up, one of Russia's most recognisable IFVs, the BMP-1. A very weak but very fast light vehicle that's also surprisingly versatile as well. This vehicle also effectively covers two modifications of the BMP-1, the stock BMP-1 and the improved BMP-1P, which can be upgraded through the modifications. The stock BMP comes with an auto-loaded 73mm cannon with a reload of 6 seconds and a keyboard-guided ATGM which can get through 400mm of armour. The P modification gives the BMP smoke grenades and an improved same ATGM that can get through 600mm of armour. This modification does remove the autoloader though, but this isn't so much of a problem as with a good crew you can get the main reload below 6 seconds anyway, so the P modification is really a must have. The main gun itself is fairly low velocity, but fires what is effectively a heat FS round, which can get through 300mm of armour, which for 7.3 isn't bad. You can punch through almost all tanks with this round and if you're struggling you always have the ATGM to fall back on. The BMP is also a very mobile machine as well, it accelerates very fast and can comfortably cruise around 40 kph off road when upgraded. It's very quick to turn and reposition as well and is overall really nimble for its size. Which is of course down to the lack of any real armour. You have around 30 to 40 millimetres of frontal protection, which only really lets you survive hits from machine guns. Although the upper front plate can occasionally bounce shots if you're lucky, but it's nothing to really rely on. You're very weak from the sides and top down from aircraft as well. And as the BMP is made up of only three crew, it's a very easy machine to knock out. Despite this poor survivability though, the BMP is quite versatile in terms of where it can play. Because of the ATGM, you can be quite effective at long range, and due to the quick firing cannon, you can be fairly effective at the closer ranges as well, which is a great asset that most light vehicles don't really have. At any of these ranges though, the survivability is constantly poor, and of course the gun depression is very unimpressive at only minus 4 degrees, which means you'll likely need to expose yourself somewhat to fire over hills. And annoyingly, you can't actually control the ATGM below the arc of the gun, so you can't fire it down 
down over cover either. Another disadvantage that comes into play more so in urban environments is actually where the turret is placed on the hull, it's practically central. Which means if you're behind cover and an enemy is aware of you, there's no way for you to poke your gun out of cover without exposing a large chunk of your hull. As the armour is so weak and can hull break, there's nothing you can really do in this sort of situation, which means it's very important that you aren't spotted. Of course that does go for every tank pretty much, but more so for the BMP is you don't really have any fallbacks to get out of this sort of situation. If you can get the BMP into a good spot, it'll do a lot of work down to how fast you can fire off shots, but it's also very easy to find yourself with an almost unwinnable situation, so playing it a bit more carefully is generally the way to go. Generally, if I can, I'd try and start the game off by finding a wide open sightline at long range and use the ATGMs. The upgraded versions are very responsive and great for knocking out tanks at long distances early on in the match. When you've run out of ATGMs, you can quite comfortably react to how the match is going. If your team is clearly winning, you can advance into the map and put the main gun to good use, but make sure you utilise the terrain to protect yourself. You're very vulnerable in the open, so make sure you always play around some form of hard cover. If your team is losing ground though, you do still have some options. You can quite comfortably use the mobility to retreat and try and wait in ambush. Or even if the map has a home cap point, you can pull back there and replenish your supply of ATGMs. Or alternatively, you can just hold your ground and try and get as many scouts and assists as possible before you get taken out. As ultimately, the BMP is a support vehicle, and contextually in the game, it's almost designed to get knocked out, as if you've been scouting tanks, you can respawn in an aircraft cheaper. You effectively get a reward for dying. So if your aim is to get into an aircraft, the BMP will let you do this very easily. All in all, I'd aim to use the ATGM's early game and then use cover to advance into the map once they're depleted. You do have the mobility to flank and play the light tank in that way, but you can't fire the ATGM on the move, and as the main gun is quite low velocity and reasonably hard to aim, if you do meet an enemy on the move, it's going to be very hard to hit them before they hit you, especially considering they don't really need to aim, as basically your whole tank is a weak spot. Try and stay out of sight and stick to some cover, and you will find some spots where the BMP will work really well. Pros, great firepower, fast reload, great mobility, and versatile. And the cons, terrible survivability. Verdict, Get it, it's a great support vehicle and will work well in up tiers where the more armour reliant vehicles will start to struggle. It can work on small and large maps well and can be a great backup or conduit for getting into a plane. It's quite hard to keep it alive but it can do a lot of work in the right spot. It's a really important vehicle to get this tier. So, first off for our tank destroyers is the SU-122-54, which is a modern take on an old design, fitted around the T-54 chassis. At 6.7, this is a very slept-on tank, really. When it came out, it was 8.0 and didn't exactly excel too much up there, but now at 6.7, it has the opportunity to do really well. It's fitted with the familiar 122mm cannon, but with a few alterations. It comes with all the same APHE rounds as the IS-3 and 4, as well as some more advanced rounds as well. It gets a Sabo shot, which is great for long range, and a heat round which is great at hull breaking or getting through tougher targets. This thing also comes with a rangefinder, allowing you to get readings up to 2,200 meters on a good crew, which is great. For secondary weapons, it comes with two 14.5mm KPVT machine guns, the same types that are on the BTR, and these are great for anti-air defense or ripping through some of the softer targets you might find on the ground. The reload of this tank is also a lot shorter as well, at 16 seconds stock, which shaves about 10 seconds off the reload on the IS-4. With an ace crew, you can get the reload down to just over 12 seconds which is great for a 122. The reload buff this thing gets is down to the tank having two loaders, which is a nice tactical segue to get into this thing's survivability, which is actually not that bad. It has five crews spread out around the inside of the tank, which makes one-shotting it with AP or Sabo pretty difficult. Armour overall has a fair bit of potential against kinetic rounds. The front and immediate side plates are 100mm thick at a slight angle, making you immune from the American 76 and 90mm guns and the Germans long 75 and short 88. So against weaker enemies, this thing can be really strong. The long 90 and 88 can still get through though, but at the longer ranges, you can bounce these guns if you angle slightly. If possible, angle the left side of the tank from your perspective slightly towards the enemy. If you get it just right, the side plate will almost always trigger a bounce. The mantlet is made up of two 100mm plates, so nothing's getting through there either. The front plate at this angle can be penetrated though, but as there's only a sliver of the armour visible from the left side, and if you're on the move and at range, this becomes a very hard shot for an enemy to land and this is what I do if you know a shot's coming in. Reactive mobility and top speed are pretty good when spaded as well. You can turn and manoeuvre easily enough, and can reach a straight line speed in the high 30s off-road, which is decent for the sort of tank this is. Although it does take a while to accelerate, its speed isn't incredible, but it doesn't in any way hold the tank back, which is good enough really. 
This TD is a lot more versatile than most, but I'd still say it has the most advantages of range. Your armor is more effective here, and you also have more time to angle if you can see an enemy lining up a shot, and you also have the rangefinder too. Another really big advantage this tank has is the ammo options it gets. You basically have something for every situation. The APHE for one shots, the Sabo for long range, and the Heat for tough targets. So when this thing is spaded, it really does have a lot of potential. Stock though, it doesn't quite have the edge it needs, and you might need to play it at the closer ranges. But the more upgrades you get, the further away you can play effectively. The stock APHE round will struggle at range, so playing the support around your team will be a good option until you get some of the stronger rounds. You can also spray enemy tracks with machine guns to milk a few assists to speed this grind up. Any of the final rounds, the APHE, Sabo, or Heat are fine to use your main round, it's all down to preference really. Personally, I go for the APHE for the one-shot potential, and then have a few Sabo and Heat shots as backups if I come across anything tricky. As far as precise positioning goes, there's nothing too specific really. Just aim for a long-range sniping spot you're familiar with and you'll likely do well. Just remember to find a location with an escape route nearby if you get hit. The advantage of the armor, and to an extent the mobility as well, is that if you need to push into the map and be more aggressive, you can do that. You can't reliably brawl at close ranges, but you do have the armor to shrug off a lot of the weaker guns, and potentially some of the stronger guns as well. This thing's a bit of a hidden gem. Pros. Great firepower. Decent mobility. Decent survivability. And versatile. And the cons. Poor stock grind. And comparatively long reload. Verdict. Get it, it's a great tank when spaded and has the potential to get a lot done on the battlefield. Its downfall though is that it doesn't really have a hugely effective lineup. It's the only 6.7 in the tech tree, so you either need to lessen its performance by playing it at a higher BR, or lessen the performance of other tanks to play it at 6.7. Luckily though, you do have the SU-100P if you'd like to make a lineup around 6.7, or maybe even 7.0 with the 44100. For now though, the tank itself is still pretty good. Next up, our second TD, the Object 268, which has a fair few advantages and drawbacks too. It's equipped with a long 152mm cannon and comes with the same rounds as the ISU-152, capped APHE and heat. And as the gun is effectively more powerful, the round has a lot more penetration, allowing it to compete at the higher tiers. The reload is a bit shorter as well, at 22.3 seconds stock, and comes with a rangefinder as well. As far as armor goes, it's unreliable, but not bad. It's on the hull of the T-10, which we'll look at next time, but the hull itself is reasonably strong. It's immune from pretty much all AP and APHE rounds, even L7 Sabo struggles on the upper glacis. Although heat and very powerful Sabo will get through. The front of the casemate is 187mm thick all round, although it's cast armor so the effective thickness is closer to 177, which is still not bad, especially considering the sloping. However, annoyingly, some parts are completely flat, the area underneath the gun and to the right side of the gun where the optics are. To somewhat counter this though, if you are taking fire, you can just very slightly angle to the other side just enough so the gun barrel blocks off the flat plate, and this will save you from time to time. The 268 is also deceptively speedy as well with a 750 horsepower engine, and can just about reach 40 kph off-road. It can accelerate and reverse very quickly as well. It does struggle a little bit at turning though, especially stock, which can be tricky due to the limited gun traverse or if you need to angle quickly. To counter this, before turning, try driving forward slightly and then maneuver, as doing this will give you a little bit more power in the turn. Like most Russian tank destroyers, range is again very much your friend. You have limited gun traverse, and the armor of course is more reliable at distance. You've heard all of this before from me I know, but this thing does play like a lot of other TDs as well. You gain no advantages from playing at close range, and as you have a lineup around 7.3 and 7.7, you don't really need to play this thing at close range. If you get an urban map, you can just play the IS-3 or one of the T-54s. On a long range map though, this thing can do really well. The gun works great at range, and the rangefinder only helps further. Because this vehicle is so fast in a straight line, it can be tempting to push far into the map and fight the close ranges, which you can very much still do as the armor is far from poor, but you do need to be a lot more careful. You have a few constant frontal weak spots and a huge muzzle break as well, which enemies will commonly go for. So it might be easy for you to get kills at close range, but it's also a lot easier for enemies to take you out as well. You hold a lot more cards at distance, and that's where you'll really find the most consistency using this vehicle. Overall, I'd main the APHE round as it can generally get through anything and has huge one-shot potential. But it is a good idea to carry a few rounds of heat once to unlock it for some of the tougher tanks at range. The weak spots on the King Tigers, for example, can be hard to pick out at distance with the APHE, but the heat will just go clean through, so it's a good idea to have some as a backup. Basically, treat it like most other armored tank destroyers we've covered so far, and you'll do fine. Pros? Great firepower, decent mobility, and decent armor. And the cons? Long reload, low versatility, 
and inconsistent survivability. It always seems a bit silly to put decent armor alongside inconsistent survivability, but hopefully you get what I mean. Verdict? I get it. I really like this vehicle as niche as it might be, and I think this vehicle is actually still my most played tank. It's always going to be fun to use huge cannons like this, and the 268 does deliver on that high damage, slow reload playstyle quite well. You have the situational passive advantages in the armor, and the helping hand of the rangefinder if you need it. If you play it a bit more conservatively at distance and on suitable maps, you will do well. Lastly, for the tech tree vehicles, we finally have a new SPAA, the ZSU-57-2, which finally changes things up a bit as far as anti-air are concerned. Aptly, this ZSU is equipped with two 57mm cannons which perform great against ground and air targets. It can fire high explosive shells and two types of capped APHE shells. The first type has its own unlockable belt and is able to get through 136mm of armor at point blank, while the second is able to get through 151mm, although this round only comes in a mixed belt with high explosive rounds. The default belt is 1 to 1 APHE to HE, so from the offset you can engage all types of targets adequately enough. Armor of course is basically non-existent, you have 15mm of reliable protection which only really saves you from light machine guns. It can hull break and is very weak to artillery and aircraft as this thing is full of ammo and will go up very quickly if any HE fragments find their way into the turret. Mobility when spaded is pretty good, it can cruise off-road in the 40s and can get around most maps easily enough. It's a little slow to accelerate but overall mobility is pretty effective. You can also fire your guns backwards for a little boost to the mobility which genuinely works really well for getting you up to speed. So this thing is really more of a light tank than an anti-air vehicle. It's even balanced like a normal light tank in terms of spawn cost, and it's arguably more consistent against tanks than aircraft as well. An aircraft or heli will generally go down in one shot from your cannons, but the low volume of fire makes it hard to hit maneuvering aircraft, and additionally, the accuracy of the gun starts to worsen if you fire it continuously, making this even harder. It is great against slow aircraft or helicopters though. This thing for the most part though is functionally a light tank, and offers an alternative light tank playstyle to the BMP-1. The BMP is more of a support light vehicle whereas the ZSU can be much more aggressive. This thing works best on non-linear maps, or rather maps that offer lots of alternating routes to push further into the map itself. Examples of fairly linear maps would be locations like Finland and Normandy, in that they effectively have lanes that funnel you from one side of the map to the other. Non-linear maps would be examples like Sweden, American Desert or Italy. There's lots of different potential routes you can take to progress into the map and it's on these maps where the ZSU is really in its element. You have the most advantages at close range where your gun hold a lot of penetration, and you have the ability to sneak around tanks to get side shots. From the front, you're only really able to consistently knock out lighter vehicles. You can take out barrels and shoot for weak spots on some of the more heavily armoured enemies, but this is a fairly risky way to play, as if you run into an enemy that can fire heat or has a stabiliser, it's likely you're getting knocked out first. So try and avoid the main lines of sight and stick to the back roads. If you take these routes, chances are you'll meet some light tanks trying to flank too, and you can easily knock them out if you're on the ball. Your guns aren't stabilised, but they're pretty steady as long as you're not going too fast, so you should still be able to catch most of these tanks out. If you can manage to get behind enemy lines, you can potentially do a lot of work. You can easily knock out tanks in quick succession and react to enemies from new positions easily, down to the fast turret traverse. If enemies are all over the place, you can also wait in ambush around choke points or corners as you can knock out everything from the side pretty much. All in all, as long as you stick around cover and don't put yourself out in the open, you have a lot of potential to catch enemies out. However, you can also somewhat use this thing at range as a sniper, but you do need to be in a very good spot to pull this off. You can still punch through the sides of most enemies past a thousand meters, but this only really works if you can land the first few shots accurately. If you alert an enemy to where you are and they turn to face you, it's going to be a lot harder to knock them out. So, if you want to try a bit of sniping, make sure you're playing around some cover to retreat behind if the enemy starts trying to engage you. As for which ammo to use, I personally go for the less powerful but pure APHE belt, rather than the improved mixed belt. Generally, the penetration on the standard APHE will be just fine, and means that every shot you fire will do damage, whereas with the mixed belt, every other shot you fire will do no damage, which will potentially give enemies that extra second they need to fire back at you, and as you're so weak, you can't really allow them that extra second. I do take a small amount of the mix belt in case I run into something heavier, but overall you'll rarely have any trouble with the full APHE belt. Something else to keep in mind is to stagger your shots, especially if you're sniping. The guns lose accuracy if you hold the mouse down, and the rocking of the suspension will throw the aim off even further. So if you are shooting at an enemy over distance, wait until your guns level off to fire again, just so you can make sure that your shots are landing as accurately as possible. Pros? Great firepower good mobility, and versatile. And the cons? Terrible survivability. Verdict? 
I definitely get it. It's one of those vehicles that's just really satisfying to use. It feels great to get kills with this thing. It's really high risk, high reward, and only really works effectively on certain maps, but in the right spot you can do a lot of work. This thing is great at exploiting enemy mistakes. It also makes for a decently effective anti-air as well, especially considering how common helicopters are around this BR. It's definitely a fun one to play. Next up, for the gift and premium vehicles, we have a very infamous event tank, the IS-7, one of the most advanced heavy tanks in the game. It's equipped with a auto-loaded 130mm gun that can fire APHE rounds that get through over 300mm of armour every 10 seconds. It's also covered in machine guns and very mobile for a heavy tank as well due to its 1050 horsepower engine. This thing is frontally immune from everything apart from heat, darts and very high performing Sabo, which for 8.3 isn't bad at all. Although it does mostly rely on which battle rating you get. This was an event vehicle that could be earned during Operation Summer a few years ago for a very long grind. It's currently on the marketplace for the price of around 700 euros, so it's not worth buying. As this thing is in the same leagues as the E100, it's likely the only way to earn this thing in the future will be through tournaments. It's a great vehicle, albeit a bit situational, but if the opportunity comes up to earn it again, it's definitely worth going for. So next up is our only real premium this tier, the Object 120, which if anything is a very unique vehicle. It comes equipped with a 9 meter long 152mm cannon that can fire some very powerful rounds. The main two types are Heat FS and an APFS DS round which this thing has access to at 7.7, effectively making the armour of anything it fights practically irrelevant. This round has one of the highest velocities in game and can get through over 400mm of flat armour and also performs very well against angles too. The Heat FS round is also very powerful, and as it's such a high calibre and has just under 6 kilograms of filler, when this round connects with armour it produces an HE effect, which can knock out tracks and barrels even if the round doesn't connect near them. So this shell can cause an insane amount of damage. The 120 is also entirely auto-loaded, being able to fire a shot every 10 seconds. So this thing has probably the most effective firepower at this BR, however it is incredibly weak with only 30mm of armour at the front. It can also hull break and as it's so large, it's a very easy target to hit and knock out by everything really. Mobility is pretty good though, it can reach 44 kph off-road and has a very responsive reverse gear as well. This thing is actually on the hull of the SC100P, so its manoeuvrability is fairly decent. It isn't quite as effective as the 100P as the 120 is much heavier, but still good. Anyway though, as this thing is a tier 5 premium, it's fairly expensive at 50 euros, so is it really worth it for that amount? And that's quite a hard question to answer generally as it mostly just depends on you as a player. The main advantage this vehicle has as a product is that it can work in full up tiers, as it can knock out basically any tank in the game, but it's very hard to actually keep it alive, especially on the closer range maps, so its performance is very much tied to the map you get and your own map knowledge. This thing is so large and weak that it's very easy to misplay it. You're vulnerable to basically everything, aircraft, artillery and everything you'll encounter on the ground. The 120 of course works best on very long range map sniping. You can of course play to the closer ranges, but you likely won't stay alive for very long. It is quite rare for this thing to survive an entire match, especially down to aircraft. So if you're a newer player that maybe doesn't know the maps very well, you might not get the most out of this vehicle. If you're very familiar with the game though, you can probably make good use of this machine, but as it only really consistently does well on maps with long sight lines, you likely won't get great results on every single map with it. I would recommend this one if you're familiar with most of the maps and already have a lineup around this BR, as the 120 will always have something to offer as a backup in any case. There's one more vehicle next tier which is objectively better as a product, of course though at a higher price, so you might want to avoid holding off until then, especially as a new Russian premium for tier 6 might be coming soon as well. It wouldn't be a mistake to buy this thing as if you can point and click you can get results, but it just isn't really consistent or versatile enough to be a must have vehicle. So unless you're very confident, I would hold off for now. So there we are guys, really hope you enjoyed the video. On screen now are the best lineups I think you can make using vehicles from rank 5 and below. So I didn't do a segment on the new CAS aircraft for this BR because there isn't really anything new. You can maybe take out the MiG-9s as they can somewhat strafe out some of the ground targets but it's not really worth taking over something like the TU-2 as it does have way more potential. Hopefully Russia gets something to fill this gap sometime soon because the jump between the actual aircraft they have that could be used for CAS is actually quite big, so um, yeah, hopefully we'll see something like that in the future. As far as the lineups go, you could maybe, if you wanted, swap the BMP out for one of the T-54s, 
or if you have another crew slot, you know, add another one in there. Uh, maybe even the T-54-1947 could go to 7.3, now the mantlet's been nerfed, and as it could make a pretty decent lineup at 7.3, uh, we'll just have to see how that goes. Apart from that, yeah, I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Sorry my voice died on a couple of bits, I've done this all in one day, and I have not drunk enough water, so my voice pretty much just sounds like a collapsing balloon. So I'm off for a big sleep later on, <laughs> which I'm very, very, very much looking forward to. So yeah, again, uh, feel free to have another look at the shop, as it will be closed for a fair while. Though I still will be operating it in terms of answering any questions, or if you have a problem with an order, I will still be able to respond there. Anyway, I will be off and let you get on with your day. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I will see you next time.